This episode, a date for your 2076 diary, vigilantism threatens the randomizer, some big but non-specific news, and a planetary physicist joins us for a chat. That's all coming up in Pod 61 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Pod 61. Yes, here we are, Pod 61. Uh, and you are? Jamie Anderson, and you? Uh, still Richard James. Brilliant, and we are your hosts of the Jerry Anderson Podcast, which is probably about 90 minutes of <laughs> Jerry Anderson-related stuff and nonsense. It probably is about 90 minutes, isn't it? It seems to be about that. It comes and goes. Uh, but yes, we've got all the usual. We've got Chris Dale's randomizer coming up much later in the episode. Uh, we've got um, an interview, which we'll talk about in a little while. We've got all the usual fab facts. We've got quick fire five. And of course, we've got uh, our lovely listeners' emails too. Have you had a good week, Jamie? Uh, so far, so good, yeah. I think. Okay, good. Excellent. We've got lots to talk about today, haven't we? We do, but some of it we have to be a bit weird about know, for some reason we'll explain tippy-toe. in the news segment but there's yeah. lots of stuff coming up this week uh yeah. which is very exciting and, and the podcast is just slightly the wrong time to talk about it fully so yes wait for some fun news this week and we'll talk about it more fully in pod 62 Ooh. but don't worry we've got other things to whet your appetite including as you said an interview yeah with a planetary physicist yes what on earth is going on there <laughs> well uh the guy's name is kevin grazier Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin, I met through, I think originally I met him through Eric Chu, who does our lovely posters, because they both worked on Battlestar Galactica together. Mm. Uh, I met Kevin at uh, San Diego, San Diego Comic Con a few years ago. Uh, and later, uh, Kevin talks about it in, in the podcast. I wasn't sure if we were allowed to talk about it openly or not. But uh, yeah. later on, we were involved in a, a White House uh, run project. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Um, for the Office of Science and Technology Policy to try and engage people in, in science and in space travel, um, which was a great experience. So we talk about that very briefly. But Kevin mm-hmm. is a fascinating guy. He loves Space 1999. Uh, oh. He has been involved in the Cassini missions and various other bits and pieces. And he's a proper, clever bloke. Um, yeah. Uh, also, strange fascination with rats. <laughs> okay well why not uh yeah but but you know a great bloke to talk to because he loves science fiction but also has the un- understanding on the science side so a little bit like our yeah. interview with phil plate all those pods ago yeah it's not interesting he was another big uh, space 1999 fan wasn't he well we discussed this in the in the interview that so yes. many people have gone into space sciences almost purely because of shows like space 1999 that's right which is very bloody cool yeah, it is really quite cool, particularly when you consider that the physics in Space 1999 actually bear no relation to uh, reality at all. Well, again, we do tackle this subject, but also <laughs> Kevin was very keen not to just say mean things about Space 1999. We, we talked about some stuff that was right about it as well. Yeah, good. So all that's forward that's to right it's, it. it's going to be a two-parter. There's about 20, 25 minutes or so in part one. Um, nice. So you've got that to look forward to. Uh, what should people be doing, Richard, if they want to talk to us and keep listening to us and stuff? Well, it's quite simple, really, isn't it? If you want to email us, um, uh, what we'd love to do, actually, is hear from you uh, uh, vocally. So we want to hear your audio files as well. So if you want to record a little something on your phone or send us an email, you can drop that to podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk and we'll try our best to read it out the next week or play your audio file. That would be lovely. Uh, Also, while we've got your attention, don't forget to... uh, visit your uh, podcast platform of choice and uh, just hit the old subscribe button there. Um, Leave us a rating, leave us a review. uh, And if you are feeling very kind, why not share us with your friends so they get to hear us too? Quite simple, but a lovely thing to do. (laughs) That's all very rhymey, (laughs) very nice. (laughs) I try my best. I'm a poet and I don't even know it. And you're a total pro. 
I wonder where that was going. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, yes, please do get in touch. We'd love to hear your emails. We'll have some uh, coming up a little later. Um, also, you can join our Facebook group, of course, the Podsterons Facebook group, where you can uh, join in the fun with your posts and pictures and uh, questions and uh, silly comments. And uh, we'll be reading some of those out a bit later on, too. Yeah, purposeful silly comments, you mean? <laughs> yes. You weren't being rude. <laughs> No, I wasn't being rude. No. No. It's a very friendly no, place, isn't it? The Podstorms yeah. Facebook group. It's, exactly how I, we I, like. I, I love the atmosphere that's sort yeah. of come up very naturally from our, our lovely yeah. podcast listeners getting together. So that's if right. you haven't tried it, exactly. do, because Facebook groups can be quite toxic places sometimes, but ours never is. Exactly. So do pop over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Podstorms and join in. There. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be nice, yeah. Uh, Richard, did you mention Fab Facts earlier? I can't really remember. Because um, oh, Fab Facts I might have omitted it. Uh, well, there's a little twist for this week's Fab Facts. Oh, I can't wait. So we get into it. Let's hear it. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Well, listeners, mm-hmm. you may well be familiar by now with Fab Facts, yes. where we have a book of Fab Facts and we flick through and Richard shouts Fab and we stop flicking and we read a fact out and we talk about it. Yeah. But I'm just going to break from the norm slightly. And this time... Break from the norm? Yes. This time, mm. there is no book. <gasps> so you cannot play along at home. <laughs> yes. Because this week, the Fab Fact has been provided by uh, Lord Randomizer himself, Chris Dale. <laughs> <laughs> OBE. <laughs> OBE. Uh, yeah. And uh, Chris's fact goes as follows. Ooh. In 1976... A VHS copy of Breakaway was included in a time capsule buried in Hawaii. Assuming the capsule's still there, it's due to be dug up in 2076. <sighs> Fancy nipping over to cover the ceremony, he says. <laughs> <laughs> 2076. Well, I shall be 107. Brilliant. And I shall be yeah. 91. Yeah, um, well, we could both do that. Now, Chris does say, admittedly, I've not found any other mention of this time capsule beyond a single mention in one ITC press release. They may have made it up, but it is pretty mm. cool if it's true. And actually, it is the sort of thing they did during the 70s. I mean, Blue Peter were always burying time capsules capsules in the Blue Peter garden and building sites and so on. Yeah, they're It's everywhere. a very 70s thing to do, I think. Yeah, but isn't that a nice, a nice thought mm. that uh, yeah. when, when you and I are very old... Ah... Oh. <laughs> uh, That'll be dug up and they'll go, well, we haven't got anything to play this with and they'll chuck it yeah. in. <laughs> that's right, that's right. No, so I bet somebody somewhere will still have a VHS player. Of course they will. Yeah, I should think so. Or you'll just yeah. be able to put it on a on a sort of holographic covered desk uh, yeah. and somehow yeah. it'll remotely play it without need yeah. of, a, of, a, of tape heads and stuff. That's right. Or you just stare at it with your cybernetic eye implants and it'll just play in front of you on a exactly you know, and hopefully someone screen. will go and dig up this very podcast and hear it and hear us talking about it and go what a ridiculous view of the future those two idiots yeah had. yeah yeah anyone got a vhs player but isn't it amazing that that you know a sci-fi tv show they thought this is sufficiently important and interesting to put into a time capsule Yes. Oh, absolutely. And we know that now, don't we? I mean, yes, amazing that they thought that then. But now we do know that. We know that all this stuff is so culturally significant. You know, we wouldn't hesitate to put something like that in a in a time capsule for future generations to enjoy and discover, would we now? Well, absolutely. But yes, certainly in the 70s. But I wonder how, how many other times an Anderson-related thing has gone into space or uh, or been been buried or, yeah. you know, kept for posterity. So I'm pretty sure that there was a... Um, uh, a mission out it may be, even have been the Cassini mission where mm. a, a gold uh, CD-ROM or something yes, uh, yes. for the appropriate time Floppy went disc. out with a load of data and names and stuff on it that they thought was sufficiently in- interesting and important and I'm pretty sure Dad's name ah. was on a on a disc of some sort that went out into space fantastic I'm not aware of any other uh, time capsule stuff but yeah. Astrons if yeah. you know of any Jerry Anderson related items that have gone into space underground into the sea mm-hmm. or have been transported to a parallel universe <laughs> and somehow you know about it could happen uh, please let us know podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk well well very nice that's a great one Jamie I enjoyed that thanks uh, so that is the end of this week's Future, Future Fact, Fact. <laughs> perfect <laughs> nice I love that Core. Cool. Well, I wonder if I could bury something of mine somewhere to be dug up in a hundred years' time. What would be of interest, do you think? Comlock? Yeah. I mean, multicom. Um, sorry. <laughs> exactly. I always get it wrong. Yeah, my shirt. I think that might get a bit uh, 
worm eaten by the t- a bit soil. <laughs> more worm. Oh, yeah. Richard. <laughs> oh, Richard. Sorry. <laughs> Right, Jamie, it's time for your uh, quick five five. Are you oh, ready for these? Not really, but right, go on. Now, I've given this one an umbrella title, okay? Supercar got there first. So, favourite pilots Fireball XL5, Steve Zodiac, or Supercars, Mike Mercury? Ooh, Steve. Hmm. Recurring villains Thunderbirds the Hood, or Supercars, Master Spy? <laughs> Um, Master Spy for comedy value. Very good. Uh, professors. Space 1999's Professor Victor Bergman or Supercars Professor Rudolf Popkiss. Oh, sorry, Popkiss. It's got to be Bergman because he's so Doctor oh. Who. Favourite Cockneys voiced by David Graham. Thunderbirds Parker or Supercars Ben Judd. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, Parker, come on. Uh, Iconic voice. Be. And finally, favourite cars. Straker's car from UFO or Supercar. Oh, I feel really mean to pour Supercar, but it's Draker's car. <laughs> oh, there we are. Well oh, done. Good yeah, selection, Richard. Yeah, yeah, great. Now, how are you finding these uh, quick fire fives each week? Are they, you, they, they just <laughs> it's quite... kind of rolling off the tongue each time? Mm, I'm having to dig deep now, really dig deep, because we've got beyond the whole who's your favourite character, what's your favourite uh, theme tune, all that sort of thing. But it's quite fun doing a, you know, a little bit of research. Of course, the trouble is, as I mentioned to you, we were due to do this, record this podcast 20 minutes earlier than we started because I got caught in the uh, the rabbit hole that is the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel <laughs> looking for stuff. Oh, this looks interesting. Oh, I'll watch that. Oh, there's Chris Dale talking about this. Oh, here's a new briefing from Ross. Oh, here's this. You just get stuck. Half an hour went by. It is, I wasn't ready. It is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's a lot of great stuff on there. Yeah, every, everybody's working very hard, actually, on uh, yeah. turning out content for us. Yeah. So uh, thank you to the whole team for all that. To uh, Chris, AC, Chris... D, that is, not T, and, yeah. uh, and Ross, and you and me, obviously, Richard, because we're doing the well, podcast obviously. nonsense. Well, absolutely right, yes, yeah, quite right there too. There you go. Well done, Team Jerry Anderson TV YouTube channel stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really long title you've just given us all there. I didn't mean to, sorry. Uh, I'm sure there's a, an acronym, but it probably will sound rude or... Yeah, it probably like would, yes. We'll leave that, I think, yeah. Anyway, Richard, have you got yes. some uh, comments or anything you want to read out, or should we just go straight into some Jerry Anderson news? Let's have some news, and then I'll read out some comments from the Facebook group, shall I? Why not? It's newsy, Let's news, news, some... news, news. Newsy, news, news, news. Ah, you got there first. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. there's loads of newsy, news, 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 Richard, but because Go of the on, timing of this podcast, oh. I'm not quite sure how much newsy, news, news, news I can talk about directly, so I'm going to be... Uh, a a loody lood lood looding to the news 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 news. <laughs> okay, right. Well, this sounds interesting and exciting. So today, yeah, Monday, the twelfth yeah. of August, twenty nineteen. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, we have announced with uh, somebody else. Yes, a thing. <laughs> right, <laughs> which will okay. make some nineteen uh, eighties Jerry Anson fans. Very happy. Those who watched Jerry Anderson shows in the 1980s. Is okay. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if you don't uh, know that's by it? Now, well, that's kind of all I can say. But <laughs> the news will will be in due course on the Jerry Anderson yeah. website, and uh, it, it may get picked up elsewhere, and uh, okay. it will certainly be on the Podstrons group. But it's something that's been bubbling along for a while. It's some um, redevelopment, reimagining stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's very exciting, and, and I'm very glad that we're able to finally talk about it because it's one of the many things that you and I have previously alluded to and talked about, yes, but yes. been able to mention even less than we are today. That's right, I know. So, yeah, next week mm. we'll be able to talk about it even more because it definitely will have happened by then. Uh, yes. Now, I mean, can I probe a little deeper? Is this for some sort of broadcast? I mean, I you, can't, 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 can't no. even. No, no, no. It no, all become even... clear if you look at the news thing on the Jerry. Is Anderson it some website. sort of nutritional snack <laughs> based on a Jerry Anderson eighties? <laughs> Voiced by no? Brian can't... Blessed. Yeah. You, the Into Infinity Bar. <laughs> no, no, no. It, not. It's not that. Wow. Go and Very look good. on the website. Yeah. Even more tantalisingly and annoyingly, what coming what? up? What? Yes, coming up later this week is another bit of exciting news which we currently oh. can't talk about because it's a couple of days early. But I do suggest you pay attention online um, on Wednesday this week. That's the fourteenth of August, twenty nineteen. Um, right for something else. Oh, I'm so sorry that I can't get be more specific. But we will be more specific and we'll talk about it all more in depth next week in Pod Six. I mean, is there anything we're allowed to talk about? Uh, yeah, I've got some other news. 
Oh, good. That's a relief. Right, okay. So, uh, now, Richard, I know you've got a giant life-size Captain Scarlet in your uh, in your bedroom there, just behind you're, you. You're, uh, no, it's my spare room. At in your spare room. Not, not my bedroom. Thank Sorry, you, Jamie. He, he's only in the bedroom for short periods uh, yeah. when he's allowed to visit. Uh, no, but many of you will be uh, have wanted to get the Big Chief one-sixth scale Captain Scarlet replica figure. Mm-hmm. Um, because they're beautiful. Now, they've been delayed and delayed and delayed, and it's all been very frustrating, but uh, we've seen the, the sort of final images from the factory. They look amazing, and the boxes are beautiful, and they're lovely. However, mm-hmm. the full allocation of Captain Scarlet replica figures that were, were uh, well, allocated to the Jerry Anderson store have all yeah. sold out. It's gone. Oh, it's done. Right. So if you missed out, I'm really sorry. Um, oh, there is gosh, that's a lesson though, isn't it? It is. Well, it's difficult uh, though because it kind of gets delayed, and you think, "Oh, shall I go for it? Oh, I'll wait yeah, a bit longer." Yeah. But it's they're gone. Uh, right. It's possible that a couple of people who have put deposits down well won't follow through, so a couple more may become available. So if you go yeah. to the the website, search for Big Chief Captain Scarlet. There's a little tab on the side that not- says notify me if this becomes available. Um, mm-hmm. But do also drop a line to Tim, tim at jerryanderson.co.uk and let him know that you're desperate and uh, he'll put you on a waiting list. And if they become available, we'll let you know. But otherwise, sorry. <gasps> yeah. Them's the breaks. <laughs> Them's the breaks, Richard. That's As it. the kids say, sometimes, <laughs> never. Uh, however, there are things that are limited edition that are still available. <laughs> Oh, good. Particularly for UFO fans. Did you see, Ooh. Richard, the UFO soundtrack is, uh, has been announced and is coming out yes. on the 13th of September, which strangely is Breakaway Day Space 1999. That's right. But it's a UFO thing, thing coming out. Well, hmm. no, I mean, UFO Series 2 became Space 1999, yeah. so why not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a lovely, lovely CD soundtrack and also a very limited edition uh, purple vinyl edition. <gasps> Cool. Which looks I thought you were going to say a limited edition purple wig. Then no, sadly not. I mean, you can put the uh, the vinyl on your head should you wish. Yeah, hmm. but they look rather nice. Uh, uh, but they're only five hundred worldwide, and they are cool. they are pre selling like hot cakes. Yes. So, um, uh, as you've just learned from the Captain Scarlet thing, don't wait. Go and grab them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something which is unlikely to sell out, but is likely to please a small number of people is a mm-hmm. Dick Spanner t-shirt. Oh, love. Well, we love pleasing a small number of people, don't we, Jamie? Absolutely. Well, that's, so that's part perfect. of the game. We, we, exactly. we, we do it every week, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Dick Spanner t-shirt, which is print front and back, designed by none other than Terry Adlam. Lovely. And uh, it, it's very similar in style to the original crew t-shirts that were given out back in 1986. And I think oh, it's okay. one of the first bits of Dick Spanner merchandise for ages. I think we, yeah. we had a little... Um, Kind of card holder ID mm-hmm. card thing a while ago, but that's it. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty cool. They're out now. And finally, for this bit of Jerry Anderson news, well, actually, penultimately for this bit of Jerry Anderson news, yes, the Andrew Skilleter prints have been selling again like hotcakes. What's another phrase like hotcakes? Um, hot bananas. They've been flying out the door. Hot bananas, Richard. We're not <laughs> saying that. Go away. Well, you do nonsense. Don't They've been flying out the door. Uh, and there's three more available this week. Thunderbird 1, Thunderbird 2, and a really nice Stingray print. So go and check them cool, out. Oh, really? And finally, yeah. I'm going to let you take over the last bit for the rescheduled Fab Live. What's happening, Richard? Yeah, so Fab Live is our almost monthly uh, Facebook Live and uh, Periscope and Twitch uh, broadcast. YouTube? Did you say uh, YouTube? Scheduled... Sorry? Did you say YouTube as well? Oh, and attention. YouTube as well, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, was scheduled for last week, but, um, you know, we're both busy people, aren't we, Jamie? Things crop up at the last minute Absolutely. and we had to cancel. But uh, if you are listening to this on Monday, the 12th of August, then you can tune in tonight at 7pm on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch, on Periscope and so on. You can join in the fun. Email us fablive at jerryanderson.co.uk because we'd love to see any pictures of your merchandise or your cosplay or uh, your inflatable Thunderbird ones and digestive chocolate biscuits uh, whatever you've got to send no more of those us. please we don't need any more of those <laughs> and of course the great thing about Fab Live is you get to join in so you get to comment live as you watch and we'll be able to read out your comments and uh, interact with you um, and that'll be fun so do join us for some cheese and biscuits at uh, 7 o'clock oh. on Monday the 12th of August Alan Rowdy you're also it's, you're doing the cheese and biscuits yeah why not mm, excellent why not? I'm looking forward yeah. to that very much yeah, uh, and great. also Good. we should say nearly live uh, because yes. there's a 13 second delay that's true enough, yes. Yeah, nearly live, exactly. Uh, almost monthly, almost live broadcast. Exactly that. Uh, delayed. Anyway, yeah. we're going to do it tonight. It's happening. So, that's it. And that, Richard, is the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. 
<laughs> oh, that never grows old, does it? I don't think it ever will. <laughs> now, I'm going to head over to our Facebook group, the Podsterons uh, Facebook group for our um, wonderful podcast listeners. Uh, again, people have been posting pictures of their toys and merch collections, uh, including more comics than you can shake a com log at. Uh, but Joanne, for example, posted, I've had to hold back on buying stuff at the moment as I'm running out of room on my bookcase. Must be a very common problem, I would think. Um, Fred McNamara has been posting his thoughts on Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, uh, and he's posted a link to uh, wearethemutants.com, so uh, pop along over to that and have a read at what he thinks. Uh, and then Alastair has posted a video of the opening titles from the Japanese version of Captain Scarlet, yeah. uh, which I think we've spoken about before. Um, also worth a look, because it's very very cheery, a bit too upbeat, upbeat for <laughs> Captain Scarlet, but uh, hey-o. Uh, and Hayden. Hayden posted, he said, a fantastic video from Chris Dale today talking about the first episodes that he had seen of all the Anderson series. So this is one of um, Chris Dale's um, fantastic Bit Rat Bite um, episodes, which you can see on the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel. Uh, Hayden says, the one that really sticks out for me is the Mysterons when it was broadcast on BBC Two in the 1990s, hooked from the off, and soon after I had the toys, the dress-up costumes, and all the episodes recorded off the telly. That viewing was life-changing. Isn't that amazing? Life changing. Well, a lot of people say that though. Yeah. I think we all have those moments, you know, whether it be a TV series or a bit of music or whatever it might be. That's incredible. Yeah. Day of the Daleks for me. I know. That's right. Funny, isn't it? Life changing. I don't know what I'd put. Hmm. Not well, like it, it literally thought. changed the course of my life. That's right. That. Yeah. yeah. Bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. The same as you getting your job on Space Precinct, Richard. Well, absolutely right. There we are. Certainly was life-changing there. So there we go. Uh, so, yes, do join uh, our Facebook group. Pop along, um, sign up, answer three questions, and I'll let you in, and you can um, post away to your heart's content. Uh, I think they've also been uh, organising screenings of various things as well. Watch parties, I think they're called. That's it, that's it. rather fun. I've seen so you can join in and uh, comment as you watch. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all for the watch parties, and perhaps yeah. we can uh, do a centrally organised one at some point, Richard, once, yeah. we, see, once, once we see if uh, Postrons are actually enjoying them or not. Exactly, yeah. So well done, Abby, to, uh, for, for organising that as well. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Lovely. Uh, mm. Well, we've talked about the Podstrons group. Quite a few have been emailing us. Yes, they have. So, uh, should we open the door? And... Oh, Ooh. don't open the door. No, don't. No. Oh. oh. This is the voice of the Podstrons. Oh, they're not as scary as I thought, actually. No, they're all right. They can come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> Richard's got cheese and biscuits, it turns out. <laughs> So uh, to make time for Kevin's um, interview coming up later on, we're just going to do two quick emails this week. Uh, okay, the first of those is this. It's from Ian Thompson. And Ian Thompson oh, yeah. says, Hi, chaps. Hi, Ian. He's trying to get over the bickering thing on the... Oh, yeah, you know, of course. Bickering? There's no bickering. No. Make it sound like a you know old married couple or something. Yeah, or Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee or something. <laughs> and what, a Chris Dale's Hartnell? <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah. Makes well, sense. Both. <laughs> Just as I thought, nothing. Uh, having watched the Thunderbirds primer, Ian oh, yeah. says, on YouTube, yeah. I noticed a still photo which made me sit up and caught my attention during the segment about the, fi- the first film outing. The photo in question had Thunderbirds 1 and 2 hovering over a Granada cinema. My questions oh. are, was the cinema in question the old and now demolished Granada in Slough? And is there any way of getting hold of a copy online? Being born and bred in Slough, I spent many a happy weekend visiting the old cinema, and in fact, I do remember being taken to see the movie in question. Great podcast, you guys. Always makes me smile when I listen to the podcast at work, uh, so I walk around grinning like an idiot. Thanks a lot for me. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Lovely. Ian, thank you for that and your, your kind words. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any immediate answer for you. However... No. Since Chris put that together, uh, and Chris will be listening right now. Yes, Chris, that, now you're nodding, and I know that you're listening. Uh, yes. could, could you uh, help Ian and, uh, and let him know? Maybe post that picture on the uh, the Podstrons Facebook group. Um, there, are, uh, there are lots around, but uh, certainly if he's got it there, then we, we'll upload it and put it there. Yeah. And so uh, you can pop along and find it. Great. Um, I have one here from Steve Rogers, uh, who says, uh, Hi, guys. This is great podcast, as usual. 
Uh, Quickfire 5 is rapidly becoming a massive favourite. Love the gasps of surprise as each pair is read out and a decision has to be made. Yes, that's my favourite moment too. Uh, quick question now. Has the uh, Jerry Anderson World Cup started on Twitter yet, as mentioned in your first primer, as I can't seem to find it? I find Twitter a confusing nightmare to use, so it's more than likely that my ineptness is why I can't find it. Regards, Steve Rogers. Well, Steve, mm. thank you for your inquiry about the Jerry Anderson World Cup. Uh, chances are it's going to start the week after this uh, okay. because this week is so busy with news you yeah. don't want it to get lost and stuff so yeah. the following week the week of pod 62 is when you'll be able to find it and you'll be able to find it just by going onto Twitter and searching all one word GA World Cup great uh, and that's that's our way of finding out the ultimate winner of uh, you know the people's choice of the favourite Jerry Anderson show ever yeah Lovely. Yeah, Twitter was fun this week. We got involved in a bit of a space war, didn't we, with, uh, with Big Finish? <laughs> we did, yes. And, <laughs> yes. Well, that's the other thing to mention, actually, is um, yeah. we, we've uploaded, or Chris, in fact, uh, Chris is uploading loads and loads of GIFs, Jerry Anderson GIFs, um, to Twitter because we've just been approved for a brand channel on Giphy. I mean, okay. most of these words will mean nothing to most people. Sure. They mean nothing to me. But it does yeah. mean that Jerry Anderson gifts are appearing uh, all over Twitter. So if you if you oh. want to post a gift, just search Jerry Anderson yeah. or your sh- or the show or whatever, and you should yeah. see more and more uh, appearing every week. Oh, fun! That That's sounds quite great, cool, isn't it? Yeah. Now talking Twitter, shall we have my top five tweets of the week? Nothing would please me more at this particular moment until it's over. Five. So Jeff got in touch firstly to say thanks to the Jerry Anderson podcast. I looked for Candy and Andy. Oh. It would have given me nightmares, but then thanks to Chris Dale, I looked for the Secret Service, and it gave me a warm and fluffy feeling inside. Such diverse Jerry Anderson projects. Very true. Four. Megan said, speaking of people wearing merchy merch merch, I was walking home from my local library and saw a young man wearing the yellow Thunderbird 4 hoodie. Three. Ian said, on the train from Edinburgh to Exeter, well, it's about time I caught up on the Jerry Anderson podcast. That's a hell of a journey, isn't it? You probably catch up with three or four in that time. Edinburgh to Exeter. Well, not the way we ramble on, maybe one and a half. <laughs> Two. Duncan reacted to the news that Fab Live was on its way by saying, great, gives me time to get the cheese, crackers and red wine in to join in the fun. <laughs> We've got a reputation, Richard. One. And finally, James says, Jamie, if Richard will be unavailable for the podcast, you could try and get special guest hosts. What? Richard, you are irreplaceable. Come on! I mean, I've only got a job over Christmas and the New Year. It's not exactly. like, you know. You'll be able to actually, record. This does tie in with... I had a bit of a dream last night. I know. This is very odd. I actually dreamt that I turned up to a recording of the podcast and it seemed to be at the top of a high street somewhere. Mm. And as I rocked up, you had a new team in place. There were three other people who were going to be doing the podcast with you. And really? I was going to just sort of slot in. I wasn't happy. I cannot believe that, Richard. I know. That would never And as happen. we started it, it was all being a bit slow and a bit kind of a bit corporate and a bit bland. And I was saying things like, Jamie, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do this, but are you sure this is what we should be doing? <laughs> I know. And then I woke up in a cold sweat. I love that you're having anxiety dreams about the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Oh, Richard, he could never replace you. That's never going to happen. That's true. There's only one me, isn't there? There is only one you. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, please do get in touch with us on Twitter. You can hashtag us, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast. You can tag him, I'm Jamie Anderson, or me, Richard N. James, and uh, we'll see your tweets and read them out next time. Mm. Right, Richard. I've got some really special quick fire fives for you. Oh, no. Actually, they're, they're not at all. Uh, they're pretty standard. But here we go. Right. Top secret locations. Tracy Ooh. Island or Harlington Straker Studios. Oh, Harlington Straker Studios, because I've worked there. Nice. Uh, filming methods, super macromation or hypermarionation? Hypermarionation. Really? Certainly. Or Terror Hawks. Shrinky shrink shrink shrinks. <laughs> right. Unwin's Bible or The <laughs> Investigator's Magical Weird Shrinking Ray? Oh, well, I've never seen The Investigator's Magical Shrinking Ray. So I'm going to have to go for Father Unwin's Bible. Fair enough. <laughs> Bizarre sounding languages. <laughs> Unwinese or yep. aquafibian gurgling. No, Unwinese all the way. Got to be. Fair enough. And finally, boozy robots. Dick Spanner <laughs> or Lieutenant. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant. Oh, poor Dick. Ouch. <laughs> 
There you go. And that's the end of your quick fire five. <laughs> oh, very good. These are getting more and more obscure, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are. Uh, but I, I was trying to think of themes that connect shows. I and uh, yes. I was just thinking that shrinking thing, actually. I mean, there's, there's other shrinking episodes like um, Tom Thumb, Tempest and Stingray and various other things. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's hilarious. Very nice. Thank you for those, Jamie. Thanks for playing, Richard. <laughs> you're listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to us on whichever channel you're listening to us on. Do rate and review us and uh, share us with your friends so they get to hear us too. And, of course, email us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk and uh, we'll read out your messages next time. We will. I'm looking forward to that already. Uh, yeah. But not quite as much as part one of this week's interview, Richard. Yes. So it's with Kevin Grazier... Mm-hmm. And I have to read this direct from Wikipedia because it just sounds so cool. Oh, Kevin on. Grazier is an American planetary physicist known for his work on the Cassini mission to Saturn and Titan, where he had the dual roles of science planning engineer and investigation scientist for the Imaging Science Subsystem Instrument. What? Wow. What? He's a, oh, my God. He's a general science yes. superstar nerd and also advises for TV series, science advisor. Oh. Defiance, Battlestar Galactica, Eureka. He's advised on um, on gravity and Pirates of the Caribbean. Dead Men Tell No Tales. Yes. I mean, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. He's going to say That's all that stuff and more a bit. in his intro. I mean, yeah. Well, what, yeah. What and what do you do, Richard? Well, I'm an actor and I do a podcast. It's about well, it. yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I've, got, I've got some sheep. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh, anyway, he has rats too. Um, yeah, oh, good. Uh, and he, he he loves his rats. He's got a very very domesticated rat that he puts various photos of on Facebook and Twitter. So right, uh, do okay. go and look up Kevin on uh, on on those platforms. Uh, but let's go straight into it. My the first half of my chat with the lovely Kevin Grazier. Hi, I'm Kevin Grazier. I am a scientist, formerly of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I am trained as a dynamicist, a planetary dynamicist. And for my research, I do large scale simulations of the early solar system. I was also on the Cassini mission for several years. I am in my other career, my other life, I work as a science advisor to various Hollywood productions. Uh, I have been the science advisor on Battlestar Galactica, uh, Eureka, Defiance, uh, most recently Another Life on Netflix, and for the films Gravity and Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. I also i am co-author of the Holly Weird Science series of books that looks at the depiction of science, scientists, and the culture of science in TV and film. Wow. Kevin, I mean, I now feel like an inch high having heard that brief top line resume. <laughs> it, that's quite something. Uh, so it's, is it fair to say that you are both, you, ha- you have at least a passing interest in science and you maybe are a bit of a nerd too? Oh, it's absolutely fair to say that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's my self-description pretty much. Yeah, I mean, as far as interest in science, yeah, I mean, I, I'm still an active scientist. Um, my science... It requires a computer, and I, I literally have a paper right now that I've gotten the reviewers' comments back. I just have to do some edits and some little more data mining, and that's another paper that, in fact, it's actually in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, so it's going to be in a UK journal. Fantastic. Well, I, I can't think of any better people to talk to about science fiction in that case. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get on to debunking some stuff about Space 1999. And also, like we said before this recording, actually, saying about some of the stuff they got right in some Jerry Anderson shows. Um, but c- can you, if we, if we pop back in time, uh, could you kind of give me some context for your earliest experiences of science fiction and maybe the things that have set you on your career path? They don't necessarily have to be Jerry Anderson. Uh, if you if they are Jerry Anderson, then great. But anything generally? Okay, in general. Well, I mean, my mom was a science fiction fan. My dad, my dad referred to it as that Treco Frico crap. So, but my my mom was a, a science fiction fan. You know, so I grew up with that. Watching Star Trek, uh, watching Lost in Space. Um, I did watch the original Thunderbirds. Okay. As a kid, uh, so I remember those fondly. Um, that was that was shown right after I got home from school when I was young. And um, really, what got me going was Star Trek, the original Star Trek. Um, watched the reruns incessantly. There's some I've seen dozens of times, some episodes. Um, I'm dating myself here, but I did actually watch Breakaway 
when it first aired. Um, it was, I, I grew up in the Detroit area, so the local station was across the river in Windsor, Ontario, it was Channel 9, and the first broadcast of Breakaway, I was there, and it kind of blew my mind, because it, it wasn't Star Trek, and it was very different, and it was very cool. Um, I, I feel like I should, like, just... Like take a break from speaking and then let you chime in here at some point. No, no, uh, I'm going to let you keep going and I, I will chime in as and when necessary. But I, I already you kind of set up set up this great kind of smorgasbord of uh, of kind of must have science fiction education early on. But you know, with, with all that going on in the background, and I'm, I'm interested actually just briefly touching on Thunderbirds. Was that weird for you as a as a kid growing up in North America? versus all the kind of live action sci-fi stuff that was going on were the marionettes a barrier to you no not at all i mean i think as your your kid you're a lot more forgiving of things i mean they look like little people i mean i i never even thought about that until just now as, as, as being a barrier it's just a different presentation of a, of a of a cool science fiction show i mean that's it and I'm completely with you, but it's it's just funny because we you know we we hear uh, quite a lot of resistance from uh, from US um, broadcasters towards marionettes because they go oh you know kids don't don't like them they won't get them and we never really had that in the US but clearly it you know it is just it's just another way of storytelling so and that, marination and that, right that's it well remembered very nice yeah do you, do you remember any of the vehicles and stuff from that show or is that too too far in a distant memory. You know, I've been debating debating this with myself for, for a while now. Do, do I do I say the ones that I like? I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to mismatch the number with the craft. Is, is, is my fear. We we can uh, we can be very forgiving, Kevin. Absolutely. The fact that you you've said you watched it and you enjoyed it as a kid, you, you're already onto a winner. Uh, I mean, Thunderbird Two, which is the big green one, is, is most people's favorite. But I'm wondering if you were more interested in kind of space stuff even then. Yeah, well, Thunderbird Three. Um, I'm going to look these up. I got my phone here. Um, and I'm going to make sure I have the wrong, the right one. Thunderbird. Thunderbird three is the big kind of orangey red space spaceship, space rocket. Oh, I got that one right. Yes, that's the, that's the, that was the one I liked because it went into space. I mean, and um, what do you say was people's favorite? Thunderbird two, the big green one, which is the kind of the equipment carrier with the. Oh yeah, it looks like a um. God, there's a there there are actual. Uh, planes these days that are big, you know, one called the whale that, that, you know, yeah. holds the carry stuff. Um, Thunderbird five was a space station, wasn't it? Yeah, that's it. Wow. I'm actually remembering these. I actually kind of scared that I'm remembering these things, but well, it must um, have made a positive impact, which is really nice to hear actually. Well, that's true. But um, yeah, Thunderbird five was a space station. Thunderbird, and I, I think three and five are my favorites. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense uh, for wh whatever the right, it? <laughs> it really does. Uh, so that that must have stuck out very slightly compared to what you're watching. But if you were such a big Trekkie, can can you kind of just give me a little comparative feeling for how it was watching Breakaway for the very first time against the backdrop of having watched Star Trek and Lost in Space? Because they're quite different in tone. They are. I mean, Lost in Space was kind of like. Um, for me, I was never a huge fan. I watched it because it was science fiction and it was better than non-science fiction. But you know, okay. I just it was it was something like I, I've seen them all again multiple times. But I mean, Dr. Smith, I mean, e even as a kid, I'm sitting here saying they need to off this guy. They'd be so much happier. And then Mrs. Robinson would make a passion plea about about our humanity, and then they would bring keep him alive to put us in jeopardy again. So no, I would have just taken them out back and said, see you later, buddy. And that's, I mean, as, as a kid, I'm saying that. So I, you know, he just had to go. I, I just, I couldn't see keeping that guy around. So it was super frustrating constantly. But Star Trek, the same original Star Trek, and, and remember, there was almost a decade between Star Trek and Space 1999. Yep. So what we learned about special effects clearly, um, uh, you know, advanced quite a bit in, in the interim. Of course, you know, Brian Johnson had, uh, was on 2001, right? Yeah, that's it. And, um, you know, he worked with John Dykstra. And so the, what we knew about effects had, had, you know, taken a big, a big leap. So the, the, the realism looking of Space 1999 and was, was, you know, set it apart, set it differently. Um, Star Trek is also, um, 
uh, so far in the future that, um, you know, the science, of course, is, is really fantastic. It's way out there. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, futuristic. Um, I, I, for the Hollywood Science um, series of books, I was interviewing uh, Narain Shankar, who is, he's now the showrunner of The Expanse. He was a showrunner on CSI for several years. Um, but he also, he, he started on, on Next Generation and he was a science advisor for, for one year. And he was talking about that job and he said, science advisor on Star Trek isn't about real science. It's about the consistency of made up stuff. Only he didn't say stuff. <laughs> you, can, you can fill in whatever, you know, the word there. Um, but anyway, um, but that, no, that's true. You just, you just want to stay consistent with, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to, stay consistent with the laws of physics you have to stay true to the laws of physics as you have established them yeah and they establish a pretty different you know you know science some you know the transporter as far as i'm concerned is a murdering clone maker but still um and i'm with dr mccoy on that one but <laughs> again they're, they're consistent with their own tech but it's just so far out there when space 1999 comes along i mean we i've seen the commercials and it looked really cool but you had a much more realistic um, feel you, you had a world that from the word go, I could see this happening in my lifetime. I could see myself on moon base alpha. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of people who feel this way. Have you ever seen a craft more designed to get stuff done than the Eagle? This doesn't say, you know, I'm a swooping fighter. I am designed to be beautiful. I designed to work and get stuff done. I mean, that, that was a super cool. And um, we had the Raptors in Galactica. That's probably the next follow on as far as a, a craft that is designed to be, you know, functional, but not beautiful. It's designed, you know, it's, but you know, you don't see many of those because people want their spaceships to be gleaming and, and, you know, Eagle looked just, it was, it was unique. I mean, a lot of people, again, like I said, I, that I know have very fond, um, have affection for, for, for the Eagle transporter. So you had this new world that looked like it could be, um, you kind of like to think it could be by 1999, what, what was it, 1975? Sadly, things didn't work out that way, but that's plausible. Um, that So so it, the feel was just very different, and it just had a sense that this could be, this could happen in our time, where Star Trek really didn't. I mean, Star Trek might be our future, it's just not my future. Okay. I love, I, I love that. That's a great, a great summary. So it was, it was kind of much more relatable and within reach because of the time scale and because of the, the look and the feel and the approach to it. Right. Absolutely. The, um, it, and, um, alpha was kind of, you know, gleaming and it, it did look sort of pristine, but if you, if you ever looked at the model or the tech manual, which I had the model, and I will admit that I am looking at the tech manual on my shelf as I speak. Oh, so. um, I mean, there are there's the vehicle assembly building, you know. Um, so th there are places again that are designed to get stuff done, whereas you know the old rub about the Enterprise was where's the bathroom? You never see a bathroom. <laughs> really. You, you don't see where they, you know, you see engineering, which again is all pristine and gleaming. You don't see anybody with oil on them or in coveralls. Um, 1999, you know, Moonbase Alpha just, you know, had this sense of it's, it exists to get stuff done. Nice. Which is, which is per perfectly fits the whole aesthetic, doesn't it? The Eagle being, although it's, it's very practical, it is, it is a really, really cool looking craft too oh yeah i mean you know the it's in practical if you take off the, the center section and you have just this these you know the, the the propulsion section and the the cockpit section connected by this spindly you know structure yeah that you know flying without a center pod it's a little bit st structurally unsound <laughs> but it generally how often do you see that not very often not very often. And, and we can, you know, although it's kind of uh, set in near or was set in near a future realism, there are still some fairly major uh, concessions, right? Uh, one of those being, 
concerning the main premise of the show and the moon being blown out of Earth's orbit, I know you've written about that in the first Hollywood science book. Um, would you care to comment on the likelihood of that ever happening or being possible? That's not. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> Easy no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, uh, you would have to convert a sizable fraction of the moon's mass into energy to, to do that. Um, there's so many things wrong with that. But, you know, at some level, I say, so what? Because science fiction, um, be it literary or television or, or theater or film, feature films, science fiction has always been about go with me on this one fantastic thing and then we'll try to be true to the science or, you know, true to the laws of our universe the rest of the way. Yep. And it, that's a gimme. You, you usually get at least one gimme in science fiction. At least you should. I realize that today people are waiting to pounce on any scientific inaccuracy online. Um, that might be a bigger problem today than it was in 1975. Um, but nevertheless, um, if you give go with that gimme, I mean, the world seemed pretty, pretty realistic. Uh, you just have to buy into that fact that there's no way the moon's ever going to get pushed out of Earth's orbit, certainly not intact. Yeah, certainly not intact, although it is gradually moving away bit by bit, right? About an inch a year, about the same rate that your fingernails grow. There's no causal relationship that I know of, but they're... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, well, 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 we'll forgive that, and I assume that as a kid watching it for the first time, it didn't bother you. That wasn't a bit where you were like, oh, that's never going to happen. Or, or, or did you believe it so much you ran outside to check the moon was still there? <laughs> um, probably closer to the latter, but, <laughs> but no, I, mean, I was blown away by it, pun partially intended, just because of the look and the feel and the realism and, uh, and just something, some new uh, science fiction that I didn't lament not killing Dr. Smith and I didn't lament that I've seen this episode 30 times already. So it was, there was, it was new, it was cool, and it was just so different. It would be a couple of years um, until we got something really that new and different again. That would be um, Star Wars. Right. You know. Okay. And, so, and obviously they were taking a lot of their cues in terms of model work and visual effects from Space 1999 too. So there's a, there's a kind of integral uh, relationship there. Well, there was. Yeah, there was. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. No, no, no. You can, you can interrupt away. Go for it. No, I was just going to say there's, you know, again, it's, it's, this industry moves forward, um, you know, sort of like the old saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. And certainly there was some, you know, crossover between some, as I understand, 1999 affects people and Star Wars. Yes. Yeah. Well, eventually, uh, Brian Johnson would go and join the Star Wars lot. So a hundred percent. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and George Lucas spent a lot of time coming around Bray studios where they did the effects unit for 1999 to pick up tips and, uh, and see how they were doing things. So, yeah, standing on the shoulder of giants, standing on the shoulder of giants, standing on the shoulder of giants, I guess. Uh, exactly. Now, we, we've been slightly cruel uh, by immediately attacking the central premise, and I, I agree with you that it, it's absolutely fine to have at least one gimme in science fiction. So, reflecting on Space 1999 and its, and its science and its predictions and its uh, ambition for where we might go in space and how we might do it, what, what were they getting right, do you think? Or what things were they starting to, to hint at? What, any special bits of foresight you can remember from it? Oh, of course. You know, they, they had, um, like I said, you know, I, we've already covered several things. Um, I think the moon base alpha itself is another element that looks practical more than it, it exists for the aesthetics. It's not beautiful um, in the traditional sense. It looks functional, and what we learn, and this is kind of understated, it kind of flies under the radar, but in season one, we ran Alpha from main mission, which is elevated, but later we moved to command center, which presumably always existed. I don't think they, they hollowed out part of the moon in that intervening time just to move everything subsurface. So I'm sure that I've always assumed that large portions of Alpha exist underground. Certainly we know that also because we see the launch pads with, you know, pulling the eagles underground. So the, the fact that the implication that most of this structure is, is subsurface is actually um, good because you want 
um, as little exposure as possible to the harmful radiation, the solar winds, you know, space is a harsh environment. So you want as much of the, you know, overburden or want as much rock and stuff above you to shield you as, as you can. And I thought that was always an implication that much of alpha is, is underneath, underneath the ground. Um, so, so again, there's, there's sort of a, a, um, implied prediction that I think is something that we're going to have to do when we go to the moon. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, the, it, it, the whole kind of um, utilitarian aspect did keep it kind of grounded in reality. Uh, and also the mood of the, uh, the crew of alpha. Well, certainly until the second series, but we can touch on that in a minute. Um, it, in terms of the, the characters, the types of people that were there, I mean, I, we often see science fiction where there's like a loose cannon kind of character, uh, someone trying to prove themselves. And these are the sorts of people that you'd never realistically send into space as astronauts. So do you, do you think part of the success of it was that the, the way the crew was written and portrayed and the situations they were put into through the storytelling? Um, well, I, certainly you said we'll allude to this later, so uh, or we'll go to this later. So um, there's definitely a difference in their demeanors between season one and two. But um, just, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean Alan Carter connected with me from the word go because he's you know he's the guy everyone wants to be. He's the the, the pilot, you know. He's got the cool Australian accent, and uh, so yeah, he was you know he's brave. He's, he's so yeah, he was the person that that I latched onto immediately. Is he's he's the guy that I'm going to be following throughout this. And so, so yeah, I mean, there's something you, you want someone that any, everybody's going to latch onto and say, I, I, I can relate to this person or I want to be this person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't, it, interestingly, I, I didn't relate as much to Victor Bergman, who was the scientist. Um, I appreciate his character. I liked his character. I was sorry. We didn't see him in season two, but it was nevertheless, it was Alan Carter that I said, ah, he's, he's my guy. Uh, in terms of actual episodes and, and happy memories of that, that kind of thing, are there any that particularly stick in your mind today? I mean, the one that normally people go to is Dragon's Domain, which you may well go to, but are there any others, uh, too, that, that, stick, that stick fondly in the memory? I did like Dragon's Domain. Um, there was, that was creepy. <laughs> creepy as hell. Um, yeah. yeah, it was. I mean, the, I don't even know what the creature was called, the, but we, you know, we also have a sense of, of continuity there. You had the ultra probe, you know, so the, the meta probe, ultra meta probes, you know, they, they was obviously like a, like a, a line lineage of ships. Um, the, um, the ultra probe wasn't our, you know, our first rodeo. I mean, I'm, I'm not messing up. Is it, I, I might be confusing them. Once, um, was it meta or ultra in, in the pilot episode that we get the star uh, games? The meta probe that's, in the first episode. That's, that's what I thought. So, so we have this the action in, in um, that episode taking place on the ultra probe, which, you know, again, the implication being that we've done this, this thing before, which was you know, kind of cool. And then that creature was just, I mean, that was freaked up. That, I wouldn't say that was my favorite episode though. Um, there are others that I like more. Um, I actually like Seance Spectre. So if you had a problem with igniting the dumps igniting to push us out of orbit, let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, um, yeah, there, there, I mean, there was, and I'm, I don't remember the name of the episode off the top of my head. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on one. But there's the one with the immortal. He's in Lock in the Asteroid. Um, end of Eternity. End of Eternity. Right. <laughs> yeah, and the... the um, the alien was also, um, he was in, entombed or he was um, uh, jailed with a bunch of artwork. And there's a quick flash of the artwork. And that just freaked me out as a kid because it was all horrible. And these all these horrid images, people screaming. And it's like, oh, damn it, Christmas. That was, that was kind of scary. Um, Guardian of Piri was good. Uh, I enjoyed that one. That was a, that was a fun. I um, love the metamorph. So we sit to see um, uh, Catherine Shell again. Yeah. Um, most of my my favorites were in, the, in season two, but um, not always. I mean, again, break, Breakaway is is, is kind of hard to top. Um, War Games was fun. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and War Games was kind of different because it's a very 
in the end, it's kind of a thoughtful episode, but it starts out with a lot of action. The action, you know, catches you, grips you. And then it, it really is more of a think, thinking episode than it was a, um, you know, an action episode, obviously, because none of that actually happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doors act was cool. You've got, you've got quite a few favorites, Kevin. Which shows I do. Well, I told you I was a fan. Um, and also the Dorkons. Um, let's grab Maya's brainstem. <laughs> no, I, was, I, I did like that one. I mean, that was, that was cool. Um, I'm surprised then that so many of your favorites were in, in series two because that was such a, a shift in tone. So I, how, how did you feel about that at, at the time when you were watching? Was it, a, was it a nasty shock, a pleasant, a pleasant surprise? And more of that next week in Pod 62. Well, yes. How interesting. Yeah, I love Kevin. He's just, he's so fascinating and, and kind of very understated in, in, uh, in his own kind of stuff he's achieved. And, you know, he, he's yeah. happily revel in nostalgia and talking about Space 1999 and Star Trek and stuff, yeah. as you heard, and Lost yeah, in Space, yeah. rather yes. than, you know, mention the fact that he's been involved in <laughs> right. sending I mean, satellites to Saturn. It's crazy. Yeah, right? extraordinary, isn't it? I love that. And we, we always mention, don't we, how wonderful it is to hear that people are, you know, inspired in their early life by stuff they see, particularly if it's Jerry Anderson stuff, to uh, forge careers in uh, in particular fields like yeah. that. It's fantastic. But it is only by talking to people like this that when they spell it out and they say it out loud yeah. that yeah. we realise quite how many there are. And I, I bet you, if we went around, we went over to SpaceX and talked to yeah. Musk and his bunch there and went over to yes. Jeff Bezos and, and his... Um, space outfit. What are they called? Yeah. I've forgotten. Are they SpaceX? Is that him? No, that's Musk. Oh, is it? That's Elon What's Musk. Um, oh, God, that, that, would, that would really enrage uh, Jeff Bezos, I think. <laughs> well, just anyway, as well he's not listening. All this was, and Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic. And oh, all that's those, right. They, they all, I bet you, will say, oh, yeah, you know, I got the bug for this by watching yeah. Thunderbirds, Scarlet, yeah. Space 1999, UFO. That's right. So, yeah, um, amazing. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's not too great a thing to say that a lot of our progress in space is is probably down to, to Jerry Anson shows. Of course. Well, I mean, as you might know, Space 1999 inspired me to buy my own pair of beige flares. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, now we know the, you know, the most exciting thing inspired <laughs> by Space 1999 was Rich's brown trousers. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for that, Kevin. He's back next week. If you want to follow him on Lovely. Twitter, he's at Kevin Grazier, G-R-A-Z-I-E-R. Be mm-hmm. warned, there may be pictures of rats, and I'm sure he'll be mm-hmm. happy for you to uh, to follow him or befriend him on Facebook too. Fascinating Great. guy. And more in Pod 62. Yeah, lovely. Well, fantastic. If you want to listen back to any previous interviewees, of course, all you have to do is listen to our previous podcasts, which are all up online on iTunes and YouTube and so on. Um, the likes of... Um, <laughs> This is where I always... Uh, well, Nicholas Briggs, uh, Shane Rimmer, of course. Yeah. Um, Lisa Mazimba, uh, Gary Newman. Nice. Uh, Sophia Miles, Sophie Aldred. Yeah. Um, Chris Packham, David Quantic. Yeah. yeah. John Coleshaw. Tim Beddows from Network Distributing. Yeah, Jake Dudman. Um, yeah, I'm, they're I'm all there. dry now. Um, yeah. I, I've booked another couple of really interesting interviews in the couple, next couple of weeks too, Richard. So we've got... Uh, it, it's amazing how I think, oh, we're getting a bit low. And then suddenly... Yes. Wow. Great. Good, excellent. It's yes, well, I accosted Chris Barry in uh, in Cookham the other day. Yes. He promised he'd get back to me, but I knew by the look in the eye, I thought, well, this is touch and go. He, oh, he did say, that... I don't normally do, he said, you won't see me interviewed anywhere, I don't do things like no, this. No, I noticed that, actually. Uh, yeah. But, but he's um, a big Anderson fan. Yes, he said it's the machines, he said that he was in. I said, yes, of course, well, we can talk about that, absolutely. Yeah. And he does a he fantastic does brains impression, too. Ah, of course. So, um, you know, here's hoping he'll get back to me, but um, if not, I shall plough on. Let's see. Yeah, um, Richard. Yes, we're rapidly talking of plowing on. <laughs> we're talking of plowing on. We are rapidly reaching the end <laughs> of the podcast. Oh, but before we do that, yeah, we we really need to uh, defer to randomizer chairman Chris Dale. <laughs> we really do. You're right. Uh, yes, because we must uh, genuflect before him. Uh, absolutely, I'm ready to do that. Um, but uh, it, it's our postural, one of our postural's favourite parts of the podcast. Um, where he holds your hand through six decades of Jerry Anderson shows, one episode at a time in a random order. So, um, should we just go straight over to Chris, wherever he is in the universe? Let's do that. Very nice sandwiches. I have another one. Oh, uh, hello everyone. You know, 
it occurred to me that since the randomizer operates on pure chance, it might be good for me to learn a little more about how such a thing actually works. So I've brought the machine to one of the many fine and not at all crooked casinos here in beautiful Monte Carlo to learn from an expert. I left her examining it while I popped over to the bar for an orange juice and some sandwiches, so uh, let's go see how she's getting on. That, that was your cue to come with me. No, it's fine, it's fine. Come on, come on. Oh dear, and I wanted 17 black. That makes 750,000 I've lost. Uh, Duchess? What a delightful surprise. I'm doing rather badly, I fear. Yes, so I see. Uh, where's the randomizer? I thought I left it here with you. Are you sure you're not mistaken? <laughs> no, no, I'm positive. I... Oh, you haven't. I mean, you've not... You've not gambled away the randomizer? Oh, dear, 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 what have I done? Oh, only put me out of a job, that's all. Oh, never mind. I'll make it up this time. Yes, well, forgive me if I'm not entirely convinced by that. I beg your pardon. I, I don't quite understand. Well, it's just that your track record in the gambling department isn't exactly... Oh, cucumber sandwiches are delicious. Yes, um, Your Grace, please try and concentrate. I can't afford to have you get distracted and lose the randomizer for me. <gasps> I won't, dear, I won't. And, and I mustn't forget this either. <laughs> What's that? It looks like... Did you make an episode selection before you gambled the randomizer away? Open that for me like a good girl, would you? Yes, but I'm not a... Oh, forget it. Yes, yes, I'll open it. Um... Oh, OK. Well, an appropriate enough title considering our present surroundings, we're heading back over to Four Feather Falls for a little bit of luck. And God knows some of us need it. Fairly well, dear. Yes, I uh, mm, have a feeling I might not be back next week. Shh, dear. The four feathers on this hat are magic. They enable Tex Tucker's dog and horse to speak, and his guns to fire without him even touching them. And now, another exciting adventure from Four Feather Falls. <laughs> So here we are back in Four Feather Falls. I always like to see some Four Feather Falls come up. And again, this is a show that I haven't looked at very much over the years. I think I've only seen the DVDs once. But this episode was one that was doing the rounds on the tape trading network for quite a while before any official release of the series. So I, I have vague memories of this one. Oh, we're starting off with it's Four Feather Falls at night. And uh, we start with a pair of horses tied up outside the uh, okay. the bank. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Oh, Big Ben is huh? up to... What's going on? To mischief, he's helping rob the bank. And Mr. Bank Manager Guy is uh, being disturbed. Oh, and straight away he's... Uh, the people of Four Feather Falls, they don't mess around, do they? Even the slightest bit of trouble, it's just like... Start shooting. I think this is the way every Four for the Fools episode we've done on the randomizer so far has started. What do you think you're doing? Going it's back to bed. night and something's gone wrong, and instantly there's there's a gunfight. Aren't you going after them? Are you trying to learn me my job? Oh no no no! <laughs> but Tex Tucker would have rode after them straight away. Oh, and we seem to have a. Uh, and until he gets back, I'll be running things my way. Replacement sheriff here in Four for the Fools. Which no doubt explains why Ben and um, random henchmen of the week have managed to get away with. You stick with us, fella, and you'll be rolling in dollars. With the bank vault uh, contents. Ike, sure, he always has done. <laughs> I reckon there ain't no one in the West looks more like a real marshal than Ike Burns. <laughs> oh, so the marshal is a fake. That's uh, that's an interesting twist. 
And of course, the folks of Fourth of Falls have no choice but to go along with him. We don't know where Tex is at this point. No. Every night, another robbery. Just ain't the same town no more. Ain't no use just sitting around waiting for things to get better. And they won't, neither. That's it. Which ways? Not until Mob Tex justice. Tucker gets back. Which won't be for another month. Where Why is Tex anyway? Until then. I reckon we ought to form a vigilantes committee. Whoa. Okay. Even yeah. Even the marshal was a bit shocked by that. Our own hands. What law? There ain't no law around this town. I no love more. how somber that some of these Four Feather Falls episodes open. It's but like don't mean we can be pushed around in our own town. everyone despairing and pushed to the brink of yeah vigilantism. We're we're what? Two three minutes into this. Oh, the marshal. If he can't keep the peace, we will. Yeah. I mean, you've all got guns anyway, so you... We better have a formal meeting in the morning. Yep. Meantime, we better get some sleep. Oh, so the marshal overheard no. the entire conversation. You all know why we have called this meeting. It's yeah, vigilantism, woo! But, but that's kind of what you guys do already anyway, isn't it? To keep the peace. Even well, the slightest bit of trouble, you... All of you, I think, just pull out a gun and start firing. A man has a right to visit his own kith and kin once in a while, and I, for one, wouldn't be after trying to stop him. I also like how, in this episode with Tex Away, you have the the other supporting characters in the town sort of banding together to... been robbed three times in two weeks like Mr. Jackson here. ...to protect themselves. It's quite sweet. And I do, I do love all the regular characters in this show. ...a man to carry a gun for his own protection. Some of them look a bit, um... A bit dopey, but then equally other characters look uh, look like they wouldn't be out of pa- out of place in, in Supercar or Fireball. Here, and I'm rotten this town. And I say there ain't nobody but me's gonna carry a gun in this burg. So I'm giving you fair warning. The first man I see toting hardware is gonna have me to deal with. Ooh. Oh, that shut them up. Fine vigilante as you are. <laughs> A few hard words, and you all cave in. Me, I'm going to go load up a shotgun. I wouldn't let myself be shoved around. No, not by anyone. You're right, ma'am. Law and order is going to be kept in this town. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yes, I, so. I reckon under all that tough talking... So, uh, the does the marshal not... Is the marshal not hearing this? He hasn't stuck around to listen to this. No, because he's ridden out to uh, to the shack where Ben and um, random henchmen are currently hiding out playing cards. Because they're always hide, hiding out playing cards in this show. Sorry, Johnny, I, I just had to come. There's going to be trouble. What Ooh, trouble? I'm scared now. Enough at a falls. They formed a vigilantes committee. Oh, the old lady's going to get me. I no point in staying on here, Johnny. We done okay out of this bird. Although again, I suppose that's a, a nice performance from David Graham that his character is like all big and tough in town, and then when he goes back to his his um, criminal mates, he's like, oh, no, it's scary. I don't want to do it anymore. More like what we're gonna get with them crazy vigilantes around. Maybe he's right, Johnny. Keep your mouth shut, both of you. I want to know when and how they're shifting that gold. So you get back to your office. Ooh, gold and get the information, but quick. All the same, we ought to have a rifle up in the hotel roof, just in case. I'll take that stand, uh, if you like. Oh, good grief. We need someone they're they're not messing around, are they? It's like, you know, me. they're one step Maybe away from arming the children at this point. The end of the town, Doc. Uh, okay. Surely. Hello, Marvin. Now, it's all set how oh, we're going to guard the gold, but all we need to know is when it's coming. Tonight. I've told the marshal and... Uh, He'll be coming with us. <laughs> have I waffled over why Tex isn't around? I think I must have done. Right in the rig. Mr. Twink and me. Well, that seems to cover everything. Ain't nothing else we need, is there? Luck and lots of it. That's and what we need. Pants. Right here in Four Feather Falls. You can travel around Ooh. and roam the whole oh, world over. And meet those highfalutin' folks of great renown. But you'll find pretty gals in frills and laces, happy hearts and friendly faces, way back in my hometown. Yep, I'm going for it. There's a little old street where neighbors get together. Yes, they do. And if you ever get there, you'll never see a frown. 
Give me those wooden shacks in open spaces, happy huts and friendly faces, way back in my hometown. When the cocks are crowing in the morning, and the bluebird starts to sing, and Mr. Sun is never done, cause every day is spring, yes, you can fritter away your golden Monte Carlo. But if you've got an idea that you'd like to settle down, you'll love those gentle folks in homely places, happy hearts and friendly faces, way back in my hometown. Way back in my We apologize for what you just said. Well, I guess heard. folks is going to be real surprised to see us back. Shan't rest easy. Yeah, where have we been, nice boss? Place again. I ain't going to be sorry to get home neither, I can tell you. <sighs> Why are you just sitting in the middle of nowhere singing then? Why aren't you back? It's dusty old boy. <gasps> no place like home, as the saying goes. What, 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 what? Oh, I'm still no idea why they, why they even left the town. But meanwhile, back in Four for the Falls, everyone is loaded up. It's night time again. Lots of nice shadows and everyone's hiding in doorways and on roofs. With guns and rifles and... Oh dear. Yeah, Four for the Falls is a surprisingly... Um... God, there's another one. They've all got guns. This is a surprisingly uh, well-armed set of characters for a, a late 50s children's show. Maybe they're going to leave us alone. Well, I hope you're right. So Grandpa Twink and Mr... Um, oh, right. I can never remember this guy's name or what he even, he even does in Four for the Force. He was the bank manager, wasn't he? But I think he's more than that. Okay, then. Um, let's go, let's go. Let's anyway, go. he's transporting the gold with the crooked Marshall guy. Won't be long now, fellas. I'll be just about ready for some chow. Tex and his boys are, are coming home. But Ben and um, oh, other... Henchman guy are Just going to intercept the the gold we shipment. See the lights. Still no sign of trouble. Here they come! Oh, trouble! Get up there! Come on! Get up! Get up! Oh, and the background is moving faster now. Oh, my goodness! See, we're used to seeing um like rolling backgrounds on model shots where planes were taking off and such. I wonder how they did it on on this show because it's not like in Captain Scarlet where someone's driving along and you see a, a background moving past the car window. With this, when people are riding their horses, you are seeing actual, real, physical rocks and bushes and such going past. I don't know how they would have done this. The lowest kind of crook, a phony lawman. So the marshal has now revealed his true colors. He's holding up. And the old um, man along. Grandpa Twink and, and other guy. Well, we He's gonna get the gold. Come on, Rocky, keep it going. <laughs> Is Tex gonna get there in time to stop them? Oh, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. He, he ain't gonna shoot him in, in the back. <laughs> ain't nothing to stop him. Oh my goodness. Drop that gun. That is a. That almost looked like he was going to shoot him. This very odd long shot of the two puppets just plodding out into the middle of the, the clearing under the moonlight. Again, some Rick lovely nighttime shots in this show. Feather Falls. There's a whole heap of explaining needs doing. Well, oh. sure there is. Oh, okay. Well, it's all done. In the nick of time. It's all done. Everything's fine now. No, Doc Haggerty is explaining the, the situation. Luck. I would. At the bar. A little bit of real... Irish luck, too. Well, here's to you. <laughs> and Doc Haggerty drank and drank for the next three days, accompanied by some um, music there that's more, 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 more famous for appearing in um, Thunderbirds Operation Crash Dive. Anyway, that was for Feather Falls, a little bit of luck, and yeah, I like that one. I'm, I'm, st I'm not convinced that... Um, it couldn't have been longer, to be honest. Uh, I think it probably should have been, because there was a, a bit too much story going on there to really fit just that little ten-minute window. Otherwise, yeah, I really like it, because I really like these characters, I really like this show, and I really like how dark and serious it can be at times. Um, and I apologise for the singing. 
One more time. Well, it's a bit of an oldie, isn't it? 60 yeah, years can, old. Sorry, can, I, um, can I stop genuflecting now? Yeah, yeah get up. Get oh, up. Get oh, up. Fine. Do, you, sorry, do you need a hand yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Um, so, yes, yes, quite an, old, an oldie bit of goodie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's age shows, I think. It's very yes. cute. Yes. But just listening to it, it just makes me think how, how much dialogue writing has changed and how much they change the style of, of, um, of dialogue even between uh, Four Feather Falls and Stingray for example yeah, sure yeah it, it gradually gets less kind of descriptive and expositionary yeah. and, and a bit yeah. more interesting yeah um, but that particular Four Feather Falls for me I was like well it, that would work as an audio episode because they're literally right. saying you know, they're, they're doing <laughs> that kind of as you know uh, and then <laughs> yes. setting up the whole blooming thing here we are in <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing <laughs> Uh, yeah. But still, it's it's cute, and it's obviously it Simon. It was the it was the first foray into what became Super yeah. Nation. So yeah, that's right. Which is always interesting to look at. That's yeah. right. So many thanks to uh, Randomizer Grand Wizard uh, Chris Dale for that excellent episode. <laughs> yes, we really are not worthy. <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, I'm not genuflecting again, though. No, no, fair enough. I think I put my back out. Yeah, and the knees as well. I heard <laughs> yeah. them creaking as you got up. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, posturons, if that. Uh, randomizer episode has got you to go and enjoy or at least watch four for the fools uh then let, let us know podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk we love to hear when the randomizer has got you into a different show um and if not fair enough yeah exactly there's plenty of others <laughs> there's no pressure yeah it's yeah, not like it's, it's not like. there's a shortage of anderson stuff to watch no there really isn't no no indeed great well, there so we that are. kind of wrap, wraps us up richard doesn't it really i think it does yeah i think so that's pod 61 in the can as i like to say as you you do, even though there's no can now because it's all digital. No, there isn't really, is there? Yeah. Yeah. On the on the hard drive. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, c- come back yeah. next week for Pod sixty two, uh, the second part of Kevin Grage's interview. We'll be able to talk about more about the news which we weren't able to talk about this week. Um, yes. Which will be really nice because it's quite fun yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. I might even see if we can get a teaser about one of the bits of news on the podcast, Ooh. maybe. Okay. Tough to say, but that's going to be meaningless for you now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and otherwise, what should they do, Richard, before they wrap up and before they leave Oh, us? you know the drill by now. Head on over to your platform of choice, subscribe to the Jerry Anderson Podcast, rate us, review us, uh, share us with your friends, get in touch at podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk, send us your audio files and your emails, join the Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons, answer three questions, and I shall let you in. Hashtag us on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, and tag him, I'm Jamie Anderson, or me, Richard N. James, and we'll see you next time. It's as easy as that. Fine, I don't need anything else to us. Should we just go? Yeah, let's go. Okay, bye. Bye. One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Beautiful rapid wrap up there, Richard. Wasn't it? Nice to done. What are you doing for the rest of the day? Well, uh, I'm trying to hold on to my um, my paranoia that that I'm not that I'm not going to be replaced. It seems to be something in the air about me being replaced on the podcast. I'm I'm dreaming about it. People are tweeting about it. There's something going on that I'm obviously not aware of. No, there's nothing going really? on, Richard. You've become mm-hmm. like a suspicious partner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. You'll be checking my phone and <laughs> yeah, that's right. Trying to, try to hack into messages. my Facebook page. Yeah, and... absolutely. Yeah, who was that message to at three thirteen in the morning? <laughs> Would you do you know what? I, mm. the, one of the things from this oh, week, yeah. which hasn't yeah. yet been announced, yeah. I got a video for it um, oh, yeah. at four twenty six this morning, which I was awake right. for, and that was very exciting to watch. Cool. I'll send you a link to it now. Oh, lovely! Well, I shall go and watch that and calm down a bit. <laughs> no, it'll it'll push you the other way. Sorry, well, you know. Actually, going to replace me? No, no, it'll yeah, it'll but... it'll excite you. It's fine. You're oh, fine, Richard. Just go and chill out. I'll speak okay. to you. Maybe later. see you next week then. No, I'll see you on Monday for sure. No, I mean later oh, yeah. today, of course. Great. Oh dear. Uh, oh, bye. See you later. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun? 